All right. I want to start with uh, Acts 17.11. If we can get that on the screen, please. Now, the Berean Jews were more noble, of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now, we all need to be Bereans when it comes to the scriptures, no matter who's up here or no matter who is talking on a YouTube sermon that you're watching, you need to be accountable for what is told to you, whether you believe it or not, based off of what the scriptures say. You need to be examining them daily. Don't just take anything I say at face value, you know, and believe it right off the bat. So, last week we left off with Abraham and Sarah failing God by taking matters into their own hands in order to have the son God had promised them. They didn't have faith that God could do it. Basically, with their actions, they were saying, let us help you fulfill the promise you made. So let's go to Genesis 17, 1 through 8. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked to him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall you be named Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. And I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land where you live as a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God is being crystal clear here again that this is an everlasting covenant uh, between Abraham and his seed and God. And it's crazy for me to think there are church denominations out there that actually believe that the church has completely replaced Israel. I don't understand how you can come to that conclusion in light of the scripture being right here saying the opposite. Um, if the church has completely replaced Israel, that makes God a liar. Um, if your point of view on any part of scripture is an indictment on the character of God, then you got it wrong. You know, God means what he says, and he says what he means. He said, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And we need to keep that in mind, too, now for what's going on in the Middle East. There's always something going on in the Middle East. But we always have to remember that belongs to the Jews. God gave it to them. Uh, so we also see in that part of the scripture that Abram's name is changed to Abraham. So the name Abram means exalted father or father of many. His new name, Abraham, means father of many nations. In one way, God is showing his plan, and in another way, God is showing his sense of humor. You know, imagine how his conversations with family and friends would go when he would, they'd be like, hey, Abram, how are you doing? Oh, it's actually Abraham now. Oh, so now you're calling yourself the father of many nations? You only have one child so far, you know. Um, but, but, on a, but on a serious note, you know, and he was probably like, thanks, God, you know. But on a serious note, I'm sure the more advanced of you here are thinking, yes, I know God altered his name as a sign of the work he was going to do in Abraham's life. And you're correct, but there's more to it than just that. The Holy Spirit left the symbolism here in the text. And uh, when I was preparing this message this week, I came across quite a few things, little intricacies in the Bible that God left that really set this apart. You know, it's not just another religious text among all the other religions out there. This can be proven, you know, and there's intricate messages God has put in here that set it apart so we know it's the Word of God. And one of those is, is what I'm getting to right here. So... I'm going to take just a minute to explain a little bit of the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet, and it's not going to be painful, you know, I promise you. Uh, 
So the Paleo Hebrew was used by the Jews before their captivity into Babylon. The characters or letters they would use were not just phonetic, but conceptual. So there's meaning behind the individual letter itself. In English, we have to have a whole word made up of letters before you have meaning, right? So like the letter A doesn't mean anything, but it, other than the sound, when you have apple, there's meaning to that word. It's the fruit, you know. <clears throat> so in the Paleo-Hebrew, the letter A is called Aleph. Since it's the first letter, the meaning of it is first. And, or leader, you know, leaders are, are the first. Second letter, B, is bet, which the meaning and the concept behind that is house, you know. So already you have meaning to each letter. Well, what happens when you combine the two letters? If you combine the Aleph and the bet, you get leader of the house. Does anyone know what their word for leader of the house is? Probably not, but um, it's their word for father. And that's why, you know, A-B. And that's why when you hear Jews say Abba, father, it's a diminu diminutive term for what Aleph and Bet mean. And actually, that's where we get our word alphabet from. I don't know if you guys caught on to the similarity. Alphabet, Aleph, Bet, um, comes from that region of the, the Semitic area. So now the Hebrew letter H, this is the last, last letter, um, it's called Te. The letter can mean behold or revealed, but it can also mean breeze, breath, wind, spirit. If you drop the He in the middle of a word, you get the essence of that word. So you drop it in the middle of the word father that we just made, you get the essence of the father or the heart of the father. And their word for that is love. The heart of the father is love. That's their word for love. Ahab. The language is beautiful because it's like a structure that builds upon itself. Letter by letter, meaning is added. Pretty awesome, right? Uh, so in verse, in verse 15, I'm going to link this to verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, as for your wife Sarai, you shall not call her by the name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. So he adds the he to her name as well. So now God changes Sarai, which means to strive, by adding that H, the meaning that, that's built upon that is princess. But back to the point with the significance, all God did was add that one letter to each of their names. But by doing so, because of the meaning of that letter, he added the breath to their names. Symbolically, breath and spirit with the he. He's breathing into them symbolically. The, kind of similar to how he literally breathed into Adam and Eve. But he symbolically was putting his spirit into them, which is a foreshadowing of what he did with the church. He gave us the Holy Spirit, put his spirit into us. And things that are tucked away like that, that we just, we don't even, it's so easy to miss. It's, that's what proves, you know, you have different authors writing the Old Testament. The Jews reject Christ. And yet, this little fact tucked away here shows, you know, in the New Testament when, when Christ comes and he gives us the Holy Spirit, it, you, and they reject him, the same, you know, those Jews, it doesn't make any sense that it would be, this would be a fabrication of man. You know, it's things like that. It's how we know this is the word of God. And he's operating outside of time. Hopefully that makes a little sense, you know. So let's back up a little bit to Genesis 17, 9. God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep. Between me and you and your descendants after you, every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations, including a slave who was born in the house or who was bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants. In verse 12, God says that Abraham needs to circumcise a newborn at eight days. So here's another thing that I, came, that I ran into while doing this study. Why eight days? 
When we come across different numbers God uses in the Bible, it's easy to think, okay, God's just giving another rule to follow. Or there's not really any meaning, it's just another number, and we keep reading on in the book. Or some may think, I just don't understand why he picked eight days, you know, but I'll leave it at that. Really, any time we come across something that we don't understand or are having difficulty with, we obviously, we need to pray about it, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to us. Let's remember Proverbs 25, 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. And we just learned last week that we, are, we were made by Christ kings and priests. So it's our duty you know, to seek out the answers that God has concealed so that we can have those discoveries and insights allow a growth in our faith and our love will grow. Our love of the mind of God will grow. A tremendous tool we can use for strengthening our faith whenever you do come across these things in the Bible that you don't understand, and I'm sure some of you already have, um, if not all of you, come across things you don't understand in the Bible. Uh, write it down in a journal, a personal journal, put a date to it, and give it to God. Because he's not gonna, he might not answer it right away, this, you know, an issue that you have or a question you have, but two months down the line, you know, in, while you're reading, it, you'll get that answer, it'll just hit you, you know, or in a casual conversation with somebody, you'll get, you'll get that answer to the question you had and whenever and however he does, your faith will grow. And also, as your little journal of questions and issues that you had grows with more and more answers, you'll have a powerful source of encouragement that's just between you and God. It's a very special thing that I highly recommend people do. Um, so we'll use this, the eight days, as our first little example. Why eight days, Lord? I don't understand. And the answer to that is in modern science. It's... it's Really amazing. Vitamin K is a clotting element that isn't formed in babies until the fifth or seventh day. So by God telling Abraham thousands of years ago to circumcise newborns on the eighth day, he was telling Abraham the earliest and safest time to do it. That's amazing in its own right, but there's even more to it than that. The body also uses a protein called prothrombin, which is also necessary for blood clotting. On the third day, it's about 30% of normal. But on the eighth day, it gets to 110%. It peaks that, at that. Then it goes back down to 100% normal levels. This is just another proof that we have that this is the Word of God. And what he was telling him, you know, it wasn't just made up an arbitrary day by man. You know, I, uh, a few Saturdays ago, I uh, asked Derek that question, um, like how, you know, how, how do they, how do you think they came up with the eight days? And he said trial and error. You know, but he was, but he, <laughs> but he wasn't serious. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't serious, of course. You know, obviously it was because God actually told Abraham, and God actually told Moses when he had Moses write the book of Genesis down. So let's go to Genesis 17. Verse 23, then Abraham took his son Ishmael and all the slaves who were born in his house and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's household and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin on this very same day as God had said to him. Now Abraham was 99 years old when he circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. There's a joke in there somewhere, but regardless... I would think that a 99-year-old man that circumcises himself is taking God pretty seriously at this point. In Genesis chapter 18, uh, we read, Now the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he raised his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed to the ground. Listen to the language that's used here. Something peculiar is going on, something very peculiar. It's saying the Lord appeared to him in verse 1. But in verse 2, when he, looked, when he lifts up his eyes, what does, he, what does he see? Three men. Yes, three men. Uh, is it the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? No. But it, I, personally, I believe it is hinting at the Trinity here. The Lord appeared to him. He looks up. He sees three right? 
Um, and you have hints of, of the Trinity all through the Old Testament. Anybody that's interested, I can show you a bunch, of, a bunch more after this. But um, I do absolutely believe one of those three is God the Son, though. And, you know, I, when I was growing up, it actually, I didn't, I didn't realize Christ was in the Old Testament until, I don't know, maybe, maybe high school. And it blew my mind that I wasn't taught that at a younger age. Um, I, and when I figured that out, I was like, well, he, shouldn't have, he wasn't born yet. I don't get it. But that's the whole point. God the Son has always existed. So it, it shouldn't be weird to us that he is interacting with Abraham here in the Old Testament. And argue against this. You're not arguing against me. You're arguing against Scripture. Clearly saying the Lord appeared to him, and when he's just, when he's talking with him, saying he's a man in the form of a man. <clears throat> so moving forward, you see in the language of the verses three through eight, Abraham is rushing around feeding the three of them with the best food he has and being as hospitable as possible. You see in verses nine through fifteen, God reaffirms that Sarah will have a son. Sarah hears this from inside of a tent and laughs. So the Lord asks, why did Sarah laugh? And she says, I didn't laugh. God goes, yeah, you did. I heard you. 24 years have passed since God first told Abraham and Sarah that they would have a child. So by this time, she is just in unbelief. It's, well, the tr that train has left the station, you know. Um, and just in my own experience, I know, you know with being with Christy, Women aren't that patient. But, so Sarah, Sarah's kind of like out of patience now. But God does things according to his timing. And we have to keep that in mind ourselves in our lives. Uh, let's go to verse 20. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see whether they have done entirely as the outcry, which has come to me, indicates. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Abraham approached and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Now you know who was on Abraham's mind most likely during that conversation, his nephew Lot. Lot, like we learned last week, living in the area of Sodom. And Abraham goes on to say, Suppose there's 50 righteous. You know, will you destroy the city? And, and slay the righteous along with the wicked? The Lord says, no, he will not destroy it if there's 50. Then Abraham starts lowering the number more and more. What about 45 righteous? What about 40, 30, 20? What about 10? The Lord says he won't destroy the city if he finds 10 righteous. And Abraham stops pushing his luck. He's, he's talking to God after all, you know. Um, and he, a lot of the time, a lot of people are like, well, why, did, why didn't he just end on what if there's one righteous? You know, and I think Abraham might have been afraid to ask that because he's not even sure if Lot's a righteous man or not. In, in Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50, we see the reason why, um, what, what Sodom was guilty of, the sins it was guilty of. It wasn't just sexual immorality. Now, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them, as you have seen. When reading through chapter 19, you'll notice there's only two of them now. Uh, and it's calling them angels now. One of the three is missing. The one who is missing is the Lord, um, who was speaking to Abraham in chapter 18. I personally think he might have went to Gomorrah. They split. They definitely split up, but we know he's somewhere around there because he said, I will go down there. Um, but And it, one thing that's strange, too, is Lot is there when the angels get there at Sodom. He's there at the gate ready for them. He's waiting, um, and, he's, and he's concerned and worried, almost as if Abram might have sent a message ahead of the Lord and the angels to warn Lot, like, hey, you know, they're coming to judge this city. Lot ends up, he strongly urges the angels to come to his house, prepares a feast for them. So they go and eat. Uh, Genesis 19, 4, we read, Before they lay down, 
the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may have relations with them. And how does Lot respond? He offers his two virgin daughters to the mob in place of the two angels. I don't even have commentary for that. It's unfathomable, unfathomable to think that that would be a solution to the problem. But then again, it only makes sense if he knew the type of men he was dealing with, that they were going to stop at nothing until their lust was satisfied. Now, it still doesn't make sense that he did that, of course. But in his mind, they're, they're there for a reason, and they're going to, they're, you know, the depravity is just so great with them. So we have the entire city of men gathering together with the intent to forcefully take these two angels. And because Lot is trying to stop them, they're, telling, they're basically telling him that when they're done with the angels, they're going to do to him even more violently what they were going to do to the angels. The sin of the city was really overflowing. And there was no doubt that it must be destroyed. But this is a true end game of how sin operates in our lives. If you think of it as like a, a burning flame inside you, and the more you feed it, the more it grows until it consumes you, warps your mind, perverts your personality. It, it, we see examples of that in our culture, but with it, we have the Holy Spirit that restrains us and transforms our minds, renews our minds. But without God, without the Holy Spirit, if we're left to our own devices to follow down the path of sin, you, you can become something just unrecognizable. And that's, that's the whole point of why God is doing all of this, just all of human history. We're, he's, trying to, he's going to get rid of sin completely. It's a, it's a completely ugly thing, and people don't understand uh, the magnitude uh, of, of sin. So the angels blind the mob, pull a lot inside the door, and ask, who else do you have here? While the now blinded men grow weary of trying to find the doorway because they were blind. Just think about that. I actually never, I've never heard anybody speak on this particular spot, and I didn't notice it till reading it this week, but they're struck with blindness, and it, and it says, they became weary of trying to find the door. So they're trying to find the door, they become weary, right? If, if you become weary of trying to find the door because you're blind, it means when they first got blinded, they were still trying to find the doorway. It's, it, that's insanity, if we think about that. They're so given over to lust, burning with desire, they've traveled so far down that road of sexual depravity that even though they know they've just been blinded by the, what they might have thought were men, they know they're not men anymore, they're still trying to get inside for, for a little bit. It, it's just, that blows my mind. So Lot goes to his sons-in-law because the angels are like, who else do you have in the city? You need to get them, get out of here. This, this city's overrun with sin. It needs to be destroyed. He, so he goes to his sons-in-law and asks them to leave with him, tells them everything, but they think he's joking. So morning dawns. And the angels tell Lot that he has to leave or he will be destroyed along with the city. Lot hesitates. He sees his hands, sees the hand of his wife. The other one sees the hands of his two daughters and forcefully make them get out of the city. Um, and they flee the destruction of Sodom. They tell them, do not turn around. If you have two angels blinding a city of men before they're going to destroy it, basically, what the you know, the closest thing we would have is nuking a city. You don't turn around. But Lot's wife turns around. She turns into a pillar of salt. Whatever force God was using to wipe that city out also caused her to turn into a pillar of salt by looking upon it. It was that great of a devastation that was raining down. While we're on Sodom, I have another interesting... Uh, fact that I came across. Stephen Collins, not to be confused with Phil Collins, is a famous archaeologist. While digging up the city of Sodom, 
he found pottery that was glazed over on one side from a fervent heat. He sent it into a lab to be tested, and they said the side that was glazed over had become trinitite. Now, trinitite is something that you can only find at nuclear blast sites. And it was one whole side of it. And that site, they had glazed over artifacts like that. Um, and to get that, you'd have to heat it up to up like 4,000 degrees for a period of time. He wrote a book talking on all of this. It's called Discovering the City of Sodom. Uh, and while preparing this, I, I think part of the reason why I, I brought in so many uh, facts of the Bible is because it's so easy to come to church and then go home, live your life, and you can believe the Bible, but it's, almost, it's like it's in its own reality, you know, because we're so far removed in history from the Bible and the events that happened. And it's easy to be like, oh, that, you know, that existed, maybe like it's like a parallel timeline or something. But when you have facts and things like this, that it, it bridges the gap of the events, in it, the historical events of the Bible to today. Um, and it, it's just really encouraging. I think it's healthy for us as Christians to know you know, at least a few of these. <clears throat> when we get to chapter 20, Abraham falls back into his old ways and reverts to his old behavior and said Sarah was his sister again. And God has to do some damage control again. It's, it's uh, really frustrating reading that. But um, the whole, it's like a, a, just a whole repeat. But we're no different. I think I can safely say that most of us are going to repeat the same mistakes. We don't have to now. Don't use that as an excuse. But we're, we're going to sometimes repeat the same mistakes. Um, and just as God didn't take the H back out of Abraham's name when he repeated that mistake, you know, he's not going to abandon us when we make those same mistakes. We just need to know to, you know, we truly love the Lord. We don't want to continue to make those same mistakes. So... I've gotten us to chapter 21, and I think uh, my, I'm going to have to stop here. But um, we'll, we'll continue next week, whether it's me or Derek. Um, we've covered a lot here tonight. Do we have any questions or comments? Yes.